government, government created corporations. Okay, as far as the police, uh, file against the police. Like your wife that had the problem, know what you do? Go file affidavits against them, go file notice claim against them, and go file criminal complaints against that those cop, whoever did that, those cops. Because go look in the Texas penal codes. I guarantee that there's in other words, she's a victim. She she's the one that dialed 911. All of a sudden, they determined that they could prosecute her. And they determined that they could uphold store policies. These cops are nothing but private employees of the municipal corporation, whatever county they're working for, whatever town they're working for. They're just security guards with guns, okay? That's all they are. They're security guards. Well, that that town or that county, that's no different than McDonald's or Taco Bell. That's like a, that's like a McDonald's a security officer telling your wife what, what she's got to do. They don't have that authority. All of those people can do, even in their twisted system, they fall into the executive branch. They can only execute an order given to them, and they can only get involved in the matter if they have probable cause. And your wife walking in and not wanting to be masked that's not a crime. That's not probable cause. So now this cop shows up or these cops show up and they're making legal determinations that that she's trespassing. Well, facts. Only the owner of a property can trespass you, number one. Fact two of a trespass. You must enter the property illegally. When your wife walked in there to shop, she didn't do nothing illegal. She, she had a public accommodation open to the public to shop for food. Point three, your wife has to be in on the property doing something illegal. Shopping for food is not illegal. Not wearing a mask in public is not illegal. So many cops say, well, this is private property. They, 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 can, they can trespass you. No, they can't. It's a public accommodation. <clears throat> private property is my house. If you walk in my house, now you're trespassing, okay? Or you walk in my property, you're trespassing. But if I have a business I'm running, I'm a public accommodation, and I'm open to the public, I, when I'm open to the public, I'm no longer private property. When I lock up for the night and shut my doors, now I'm private property. <clears throat> but when I'm doing during the course of business opened up, I'm a public accommodation. I, I can't tell people what they can and can't do. Hey, listen, I don't like your black sneakers. You, know, you got to wear white sneakers to shop in here. Well, that's no different than I don't. You got to wear a mask. You know, I mean, they, they, and everything they're doing is think about what's going on. You got these store employees. That are they're simulating legal process. They're making legal determinations and judicial determinations that a their policies apply to you and they can apply them to you. Their policies apply to their employees. <clears throat> You're not their employee, okay? On the, on the pecking order, <clears throat> how it works? You got this, the federal constitution that's the supreme law of the land for them. Then you have the state constitution, and then you have corporate law, statute codes, and ordinances, which are the counties' codes and the, and the borough's codes and the township's codes, they're third on the, the pecking order. Now we go to corporate like this, Target or wherever she was shopping, they're number four in the pecking order because now they got policies for that corporation. So they're trying to say that their policies of having to wear a mask is now going to trump the federal constitution. Well, that can't happen just because Article 6, Clause 2, the Supremacy Clause, it states that anything in conflict with the federal constitution is notwithstanding. Well, last I checked, you have a right to freedom. Nowhere do I see anywhere in the federal constitution where it says somebody can impose medical interventions upon you and violate your rights. Well, that's what they're doing with their corporate policy. They're trying to overthrow the federal constitution. Can't be done. This is a corporation. I bet you, if you go look these guys up, the school district, independent school district, I'm guarantee they have a Dun & Bradstreet number. The Dun & Bradstreet Dunn's number serves a variety of functions that can help your business grow. The Dunn's number is a business identifier that is assigned to any business entity in the Dun & Bradstreet data cloud. Once that entity has been determined to be unique from any other in the data cloud, a Dunn's number is assigned and becomes the anchor for its live business identity. Dunn's numbers never expire and are never reused. Because I know my school districts have them. They got a Dun & Bradstreet number. They're a corporation, okay? Uh, they don't own that school. In other words, they didn't pay for that school with their money. Okay, nobody that's a part of that corporation reached into their pocket and paid for this school. That school's paid for by public funding. So they don't own the property. 
Okay? They may manage it. That's fine. Cut the grass. Keep it clean. They manage it. But they don't own the property. So just because they manage something doesn't give them authority to make health decisions for your offspring. They're ridiculous claims. Did you ask them to, to, to modify or mitigate any of your COVID-19 uh, protocols? No. You basically just stated you're to leave my, my offspring alone. You're not going to test them. You're not going to make them wear a mask. You didn't tell them to go change their protocols. They That's up to them what they want to do. And that's up to the other parents to step up to them and tell them you're not going to do this to my kid either. Now, Mr. Andy Baker has now become a judge and an attorney. He's now making legal determinations that, number one, the governor's executive order gives him jurisdiction over your offspring. That's exactly what he just did here. He made an exec- He made a, a legal and a judicial decision that this governor's executive order gave him uh, authority to do things to your offspring. That's a ridiculous claim. And I call that simulation of process of law. It's a simulation of law. That's not how the legal process works. You don't just take things other people wrote and, and impose you believe you read this and you believe it gives us some kind of authority over somebody else. Things Claims don't work that way. Claims, there's, no, there's no forced indentured servitude or uh, slavery. So we know that can't be the case. I can't own you. So the only way when I write that thing down on a piece of paper as the governor and make it apply to you is if I have a contract with you. That's it. That's the only two ways something a piece of paper can apply to you. I own you or we have a contract with each other. I'm pretty sure you don't have a contract with your governor. What happened? I'm Pretty sure you have no contracts with Abbott. So, listen, what those governor's orders are, that's for entities under his jurisdiction, his employees, the cops, the firemen, whoever. Whoever is a state employee, that's what that order's for. They don't get to write things down on paper and magically make them apply to you. That's called a violation of due process of law. In other words, these guys trying to say his title, and I don't even want to blame the governor. The governor's not telling Chad that his kid has to do this. Governor's telling that school to do this. The people running this school and the school district, they're the ones that made the decision that what that governor wrote applies to Chad's uh, Chad's kid, and applies to Chad. Well, they're never going to be able to support that because that's nothing but hearsay. They weren't there when the governor wrote that order. They don't know anything about what's in that order. They didn't talk to the governor. The governor didn't say, listen, I want you to go. This applies to Chad. And that's how these people operate. They, they, they're very ambiguous. He just writes an order out there. He puts it out there. And then these dummies that work for the school district come up and look at this order and go, that gives us authority to do this to the children. And, and, and they're, everything they're doing is they're operating by presumption. So that's what those affidavits are for, the affidavit of status. It's to remove the presumption from what they're doing. So we, we drew up affidavits against them, and we filed them with the, uh, the, the Council of Bishops. And lo and behold, a letter came back and said that, uh, no, that's not our, we don't do that. That's fully up to them. They, they decide that. So now we got one point at the other. They did it. No, they did it. So he turned around, he served the second set of affidavits to them, and he, to, the, to the local people that were just pointed to and said, hey, I'm told that you guys are responsible for this. So now he just submitted that to them, and uh, we're waiting to see. They're going to go into default with that. So now he's making it real problematic for me. He, oh, he, he, listen, he, he, he's a religious guy, he, he, you know, and, and he had some really killer things because he decided they wanted actually wanted the kids to be vaccinated, believe it or not. That's how far they wanted to go. They wanted to require vaccinations for this, this school, this Catholic school. Never vaccinate your child and to say that she's, she's got to come. Think about what that would do. That would say, hey, listen. You gotta let us assault and batter your child so that she can come into the school. Because you don't want your child touched. So they're saying, hey, listen, we're not gonna let your child to come into a public accommodation. A school is a public accommodation. Anyone who lives in that county or wherever that, that district is, they can go to school there. Free. Public accommodation. So they can't they can't turn around and say, hey, listen, in order to, to exercise this right that you have to this public accommodation, you gotta let us assault and batter your child. You know, I mean, it's a ridiculous claim on interventions. And that if Andy should decide that he has authority to make medical decisions for your child because your child's on what they think is their property, well, then you're going to file state and federal criminal complaints against Andy because Andy's committing crimes, okay? And if you look in the Texas Penal Code there, go look at the Texas Penal Code. Most 
penal codes fall under Title 18, most states. Go we'll look at the Title 18 penal code. <clears throat> go read through it. It's not long. Go read through it and go find out how many laws that are, that are bound, that Andy's bound by, that he's violating. Okay? Because here's what I, when someone says you got to wear a mask or they got they, they have a right to test you, if you don't want somebody testing your body, that's a, that's a battery. Okay? That's unwanted tested. That's unwanted touch. And if they're telling you that that you you're not going to have a freedom that's guaranteed to you unless you let them unless you let them put a mask on you or test you, well, in a way, that's constructive battery. Because before all this nonsense started, if you walked into a into a school and I put my hand over your face and limited your breathing by eighty percent, you punch me in the head and you call the cops and uh, have me arrested for battery. Well, in effect, that's what they're doing here with your your, ch- your children. They're saying, listen, we're going to batter your children, constructively batter your children. And listen, I don't want you touching my kid. That's what I say. I don't want you touching my offspring. You touch my offspring, you tell them, that's battery. That's assault and battery when you touch my child. If anybody touches my child in any way, that's battery. If you throw my kid out of, your, out of the school, now I'm going to come after you financially, and now I'm going to file state and federal criminal complaints against you. And I'm going to show you liability because not only are you going to ring the bell with your claim that you filed, guess what? When you file them criminal complaints, state and federal criminal complaints, you also got to notify the insurance company because the insurance company wants to know of anything that can turn into a lawsuit. Well, if you're filing state and federal criminal, criminal complaints, even though they're criminal, they still are going to lead into a civil suit because you're going to turn around and sue this guy for, for violating your rights. And the insurance company wants to know about that. And for your county, you file with the district attorney. And what I would also do is send the same copy what you sent the district attorney to the attorney general of the state. So now you're getting them out of their little box because your, your county's a little box, basically, okay? So when you take them same complaints and you file them with uh, the attorney general, well, now you're involving the whole state. Okay, now, now you are now you got a little, little bit out of their box. So you would file with the, your, your district attorney, your local district attorney. But I'd also file, send a copy to the state's attorney general because I want outside eyes on them. Because guess what happens? When you start filing that, phone calls start to get made or visits happen. People want to know what's going on. Why is this guy filing criminal complaints against you? Because this whole thing is covering your rear end. Everybody that's a politician, they all have aspirations to move forward, right? They all want to, they all want to advance and get more control. So when you file criminal complaints in matters, a lot of times phone calls are going to be made and visits are going to be uh, done because somebody wants to cover their rear end because they don't know where this is going. God forbid this blows up on them and it comes out that you file criminal complaints with the district attorney. <clears throat> the district attorney did nothing in the matter. Now he's got to answer for why you filed criminal complaints with him and he didn't do nothing. But we all know he wants to protect his buddies. If you submit criminal complaints to him, He's got a duty and obligation to really turn them over to the grand jury. Let the grand jury... Whoever's directly... Whoever right. did this thing to you. Because that's all you have personal knowledge of. You don't know what the CEO okay. did. Okay? You're the one doing these things to me. I got a file against you. And you're writing this letter and these affidavits as, as a sign of good faith. Because you want to give them a chance to remedy this situation before you start filing state and federal criminal complaints against them. I'm just trying to be a good woman here. I'm just reaching out to you people, trying to, you know, offer you remedy because I really don't want to move this to state and federal criminal complaints. And, and I really don't want to sue you in federal district court. I need you to, to basically provide me remedy for what was done to me. Uh, you know, and here's an opportunity for you to answer my affidavits. Uh, and, and if you fail to rebut these affidavits, you're going to force me to file state and federal criminal complaints against the individuals who did these things to me. Then I'm going to see you in federal district court for what you did. You violated my, my God-given constitutional protected rights. Your codes, your policies don't supersede my God-given rights. And that's it. That's my statement to them. I, I let them know where I'm going to move this little process. So he knows I got a destination, federal district court. You, you let them know when you file this document, you put it there. I do not want to be contacted by any attorney that has no jurisdiction, no standing, no, no uh, personal knowledge of any matter involving myself. Uh, do not let it, if I get anything from an attorney, I'm going to file bar groups against them. I'm going to file a private notice of claim against him for, for a substantial amount of money. I'm going to file state and federal criminal complaints against them. 
then I'm going to sue who? Sue, sue him too in this matter in federal district court. He knows what a bar grievance is, the attorney. Listen, mm-hmm. if I get anything from an attorney back, I'm going to file bar grievance against them. I'm going to file notice of claim and support it with my affidavits. And I'm going to file state criminal complaints, federal criminal complaints. And then I'm going to thump them in federal district court. That's where we're going to wind up. He's going to be a, he's going to be a party this matter too. Because Mr. Attorney has no jurisdiction or authority over me. He's got no standing in this matter. And he's got no personal knowledge of anything in this matter. He's an interloper that has no authority to be involved in this matter. You, I, the people that did this to me, they're going to have to respond to me. Not this interloper over here. Because they're always going to try and they want to deviate you away from the target and let the attorney interfere. Because they think the attorney will baffle you with his bullshit. And that's what attorneys do. That's all they are. Attorneys are nothing but bullshit. They got nothing. They're holding no call. They're the man behind the curtain in the Wizard of Oz. And if you get a letter from the attorney, follow through with your action. Show me you're a woman of your word. If the attorney answers, first thing, mail fraud claim. That's one. That's one page document. Pretty two pages, but just a few things. And I got them up on my site. You pretty much copy it. Take you five minutes to fill it out. Okay. Mail fraud complaint against Mr. Attorney because Mr. Attorney don't know anything. That document he sent you, he's answering affidavits. He can't answer affidavits. The affidavit wasn't submitted against him, okay? And he can't answer an affidavit that wasn't submitted against him. And uh, he's making claims against you. When you get a letter from the attorney, now he's making legal claims against you. He's determining legal things about you. Well, excuse me, Mr. Attorney. You got no jurisdiction or authority over me. You got no standing in this matter. You're not, you're not a damaged party. And you got no personal knowledge of anything you just sent me. You don't know anything about what you just sent me because it's something somebody told you. You got no personal knowledge. So your papers, they're worthless. Because you did that, good. Here's a, here's a mail fraud claim against you. Here's a bar grievance against you. Here's state criminal complaints for you. And here's federal criminal complaints. And keep on getting involved in this. And I'm going to see you in federal district court where you, you don't have a chance in federal district court. Because if your paperwork's set right, he's not going to come in and answer you in federal district court. He can't. You write your paperwork so that a, a guy living under a bridge can understand your paperwork. Like you could just hand it to a guy living under a bridge and he can pick it up and know nothing about your matter and be able to read it and understand exactly what happened. What what happened, you know. You don't have to be all legalistic. Like I said, I do stuff with Barney Rubble. You know, Fred State Ball, Barney won't ball back. You know, I do little, you know, little blurbs. Don't put things in paragraphs when you do when you do affidavits. One thing at a time. Fred take ball, one. Number two, Barney won't ball back. Okay? Uh Barney won ten thousand dollars to because Fred take ball. Yeah, you know, that's how you write your stuff. One subject at a time. Don't do what so many other people do when they cluster stuff in a big paragraph. Because because a slick attorney is going to look at that paragraph and ninety nine percent of that paragraph he can't answer. But like, you're going to leave one little loophole in there for him because he can answer that one thing. He's going to say that this whole paragraph is meaningless. So when you break down into separate points, number one, number two, number three, he can try and deny one thing, but that's hard because it's so simple. Fred take ball. You keep it very simple. He can't knock out everything else under there. So you always keep things real short, one subject, one, you know, one event. <music> Aritasir Fossius, in other words, once what gave me 15 days to either submit an affidavit or end the claim, in other words, pay it. Either pay this claim or file an affidavit telling us why you don't have to pay this judgment. Because they gave him a judgment. As soon as he filed that fake lien, his buddies at the court, they automatically gave him a judgment. Well, how the hell could there be a judgment? We never had a trial, okay? Right. Basically, it's a, it's a letter to you stating you've got 15 days to either pay this or explain by way of affidavit why you're not responsible for paying. So you could use that against them. And if you look at a writ of Colorado, that's a real interesting one. Go look at that one. Because if somebody's moving a claim against you, the attorney, or you're in a court matter, Go file rid of Quarranto against them. And what that means is you got to come into court in three or 20 days, three to 20 days, and explain where you got the authority to do what you're doing. Because they just want to assume that this law statute of code applies to you. Excuse me, what evidence do you have that this piece of paper that some group called legislature wrote gave you any authority to do anything against me? Sir, Mr. Attorney, were you there when that was written, that law, that statute, that code? No. So, sir, you weren't there when it was written. So, sir, you have no personal knowledge of anything in that law, statute, code, or ordinance. That makes everything you filed against me hearsay. Because you can't testify to it. You just got to have personal knowledge of something. 
So if he thinks there's law, he has authority over you to do something. He better have personal knowledge of it. Well, he can't because it wasn't there when it was written. You don't know anything about that thing. That's his interpretation that it applies to you. He can never support that in court because it's hearsay. So you follow Rita Guadarranto. Great, Mr. Attorney. Get your ass in here and explain how this document applies to me. And we need you to bring the principal into who hired you. Because he's going to say the borough, the township. Well, there's no Mr. or Mrs. Borough Ridley Park coming in to testify, okay? So, sir, the borough didn't hire you, okay? You're either here under your own accord, or you decided to show up yourself to extort money from me, or you got a name of somebody from the borough that hired you. Who's the name? Is it the borough manager? Because then he's worried about giving the borough manager's name out. You know why? It's liability. And the borough manager doesn't want to come forward and say, I hired this guy. Because now you're, you're moving him down to criminal things. Hey, these, these are criminal acts that people committed. Sir, who hired you? I need to know who's responsible for hiring you to commit crimes against me. Don't let him tell you a board hired him. Well, the board, you better, you know, but listen, nobody hired him. The board didn't hire him. Nobody, there, in order to be an agent, what the, what the attorney is, there has to be a principal that hired the agent. Well, we know a corporate fiction can't hire nothing. Corporate fictions don't do nothing. They don't exist. They're not real men and women. Only a man or woman working for that fiction hired this guy. Like when you read a writ of Ranto, it'll say it's like from three to 20 days and it forces the other party to come in and answer you. Well, think about somebody filing a claim against you. You know, it was the attorneys filing this claim in the name of a fiction. When you file a writ of Ranto against them, you're making that attorney come into a hearing and explain how he got authority to do anything he's done so far against you. Can he show any evidence of anything? He's got no jurisdiction. He's got no standing. He's got no personal knowledge of anything he filed. So that writ of Colorado says, put up or shut up. Come into court and show me evidence that you have authority to do what you're doing. So that's what the writ of Colorado is. And the writ of Sirfasius is very similar, you know, if your state has it. Uh, 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 give him a judgment, notice of judgment, and then take your notice of judgment and your green cards and go, hey, he was served. <laughs> he didn't respond. And I'm going to need my, here's a writ of Sirfasius. I need that writ of Sirfasius sent to him. I'm going to need to understand how he got authority to do what he did against me. And if he can't explain it, he's got a problem. I'm going to need my judgment, Judge. I'm going to need you to sign my order for my judgment. Remember, these people have to deal with insurance and everything. They have to be insured to be public servants. Uh, this guy had uh, it was a traffic violation, whatever, and they were under like 40th hearing for a traffic violation. It was getting ridiculous. So uh, his buddy contacted me, and I gave him some questions to ask the, the prosecutor. So right when they were starting the trial, he asked the judge, could he speak to the prosecutor in private? So he pulled the prosecutor aside and just answered some basic questions. Uh, what evidence do you have of your agency? In other words, these people are agents. That prosecutor was an agent. There has to be a principal that hired them to do something. Oh, the crown. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> You know, is that Mr. and Mrs. Crown? Who hired you? What are you doing here? She got real nervous because she knows she can't give a name. She don't know a name. So if you can't give me a name, you must be here of your own accord. You showed up for yourself because you can't even give me the name of that person that hired you. So when you break things down to that basic elemental level, they get scared because they know that this is not the average man or woman to deal with. This person knows that to ask me things that no one's ever asked me before. How many attorneys do you think have been asked by somebody like us? Excuse me, give me evidence of your agency. How about zero? How about the guys, your, your local attorneys? How about zero ask that question? So you ask that question, whoa. Then you start saying, hey, Mr. Attorney, listen, I'm going to need to see your bond. Because any time a public official takes any kind of action against you, it's got to be insured. It's got to be bonded. I'm going to need to see a copy of your bond, Mr. Attorney, because uh, you're, you're liable for your actions. Well, now he knows you, now he knows you know about his bond. Because how many, how many of your friends and neighbors do you think know about bondings of court actions? How about zero? Mm. How, how many times did the attorney, somebody like us, went to the attorney and said, oh, Mr. Attorney, you want to get involved in this? Uh, listen, I can't even interact with you until I'm sure that I'm, I'm positive that you're insured. You could cause massive damage to me. I got to make sure you'd be able to foot the bill for what I'm going to charge you for this. Because if you can't fit foot the bill, I'm not going to talk to you. You can't pay my prices. And then you asked about prices, $5 million, $10 million. 
guess what? You don't like my prices? Don't do business with me. You're the one that started this action. You brought the claim. Hey, you know what? There's a price to do business with me. Because in common law, the plaintiff must appear. I'm pretty sure the county's not coming in. The attorney can't appear. He's got no personal knowledge. So now even though I started this process by commercial matter, by affidavits and the claim, now I'm going to enforce it through, through common law. Uh, excuse me. Is there a Mr. and Mrs. County coming in to testify? Because the attorney can't testify. Now I'm sitting on the, the plaintiff must appear. Common sense, common law. Mm-hmm. So you're sort of combining the two together, commercial process and the common law process. As soon as the attorney files a document with you, go file a federal mail fraud complaint against them. Postal inspector, federal mail fraud complaint. He'd never seen that before. I guarantee he's never had a mail fraud complaint filed against them. So go file that. And uh, uh, when you start walking him down this process, he's going to say, this is not the average monkey. Uh, I never saw this before. Oh, my God, these filed a arguments against me. Oh, it's going to affect my insurance. Oh, she, she just filed a criminal complaint against me. And when you file your criminal complaints, it's like death by a thousand cuts. He's going to get an envelope for you every three days. <laughs> with a criminal complaint. He's going to look at every new envelope for you, and his, and his stomach's going to drop. Because he's going to know what's in that envelope. Now, the criminal complaint. Oh, my God, this woman's she's attacking my insurance. This is going to affect my insurance. So what Kelton taught me is get them outside their box with your federal complaints and do things that they don't expect to see. That disorients them, okay? When you do things they've never seen before, you disorient them. That attorney's never had a malfraud complaint against them, and he may have never had a bar grievance filed against them. Oh, and then you sent him out to Davidson. You made a commercial claim against him for $5 million. How dare you get involved in my, my matter? My property. How dare you involve yourself in my property? My prices are high, $5 million. You're, you're, you're trespassing and administering my property without right, and you're under, you're under enforced documents against me. You're making claims in your documents that you know nothing about. Your documents are nothing but hearsay and forgery. You can't make claims that you don't know nothing about. That's fraud, and you're doing it to try and deceive me. It's deceptive business practice, isn't it? If he's mm-hmm. stepping in in a matter he knows nothing about, and he's filed paperwork against you. Well, guess what? There's there's a crime called uh, in Texas deceptive business practices. I got it in Pennsylvania. So now you got another crime. In Texas, you also got one called official oppression. Go read that. You'll love that one. Uh, you've got in a movement against you. It's also called barratry. Texas has that too. Then somebody bringing a vexatious suit against you, a meaningless suit. Because we all know Mr. Attorney can't act and speak for something that doesn't exist. We know that. The other 99.9% of the monkeys out there, they got no clue. They go hire attorneys. And now you've got the three bar members conspiring to how to extort money from, from you. You know That's what's going on in the hearing. They don't know any better. They go hire the attorney. You handle it yourself. and all this stuff just know thank you for watching comment below don't forget you can if you want subscribe like or subscribe or hit the bu- hit the bell hit the bell if you want to get the alerts i don't know if i just started this channel so i don't know if it's shadow banned yet but i'm trying not to get to that level um and you know it's a free country so you can do whatever you want it's it's a free country i mean it's only free if you make it free so we're trying to get free